Good morning, everyone. What a wonderful day. This is the day that our Lord Jesus, God the Father, and the Holy Spirit have made for us to live in. And it is a great day. It's a great day in the Lord. And it's a marvelous time to be alive because we are the ones that are alive in this moment. So let me sing a song for you that will lead us into the message for the day. Sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer that calls me from this world of care and bids me at my Father's throne make all my wants and wishes known in seasons of distress and grief my soul has often found relief and oft escaped the tender snare by thy return sweet hour of prayer sweet hour of prayer sweet hour of prayer thy wings of my petitions bear to him whose truth and faithfulness engage the waiting soul to bless and since he bid me to seek his face believe his word trust his grace I'll cast on him my every care and wait for thee, sweet hour of prayer. Thank you, sweet Betty, for those wonderful ivories being tickled. What a crazy time we're living in. A lot of questions in our minds about the future. A lot of opinions being thrown around and a lot of people being called a liar and this, that, and the other. And such evidence of hatefulness and hatred I can't remember this kind of public demonstration in a long time. But we can be encouraged because God has given us the most magnificent life that's available on this earth. He's given it to us through Jesus Christ. And Jesus, Jesus himself said these words in John chapter 14, verses 12 through 14. He said, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. And greater works than these will he do because I am going to the Father. So whatever you ask in my name, this will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. That's the English Standard Version of John chapter 14, verses 12 through 14. I want to tell you a story.
and I'll probably get choked up because these people are very dear to me. Their names are Bill and Vicki. I'm not going to give you the last name, but I want to read you an excerpt or actually a post from Facebook by their daughter, Christina. Vicki's been in the hospital 17 days. She's gone through horrendous pain, anxiety, soreness of throat. Her lungs are barely working at all. And after 15 or 16 days, they finally, she finally agreed to be put on a ventilator and she seems to be improving. But I want to read this post and then I want to tell you about another post that Christina sent a few days ago. Update on Mama. Day 17. This was yesterday. It's been very quiet and still day for all of us. Mama had a paralytic drug to go on the vent so she wouldn't fight it and wouldn't have anxiety. So she's been what seems like a bit lifeless. This evening, they will start weaning her off the drug and try to bring her back some consciousness a little at a time. Doctors say it may take 24 hours. We have all gotten some much needed rest today and we are looking forward to a day of worship tomorrow. Please continue to pray for healing in her lungs and for her to stay calm coming down off the drugs. Daddy's doing okay, and we're trying our best to make sure he's taking care of himself. That's not the whole post, but that's all you need to know. I first met them close to 40 years ago, 35 anyway, at a time when I really needed a friend. And these two just wrapped their arms around me. And it was fabulous. And we've been dear friends ever since, all these years. We see each other a few times a year. They live near Abilene. And I stop and Betty and I spend the night and so on and so forth. But I tell you that because they're people of prayer. Often I'm talking to them and they will tell me they're praying and fasting over a particular something that's a burden on their heart. And recently there was a post about a time when there was a real downturn physically. And I remember Christina writing, we all stood out in the coal and prayed for God to turn this around because they were trying to not let her have to be on a ventilator yet. And they were praying that God would intervene and they went out in the cold outside the hospital and they prayed that God would turn things around. And you know what? He did. And she was much better, had a much better night. But I said that to remind me and you, that God has given us the most mighty tool in the world in prayer. There are a lot of things in this life we can't control, and we're finding that out more and more on the political scene every day, it seems like. But you know what? In the grand scheme of things, in the kingdom of God, while it does matter to God that people don't have good actions, that they don't act the way that they ought to, 
God has a bigger plan. God has a bigger scheme. God has a bigger outlook. God has a, a an overview of this world that we will never be completely privileged to understand. But we do understand that he's in control, that he's on his throne, and we can take great um, solace in the fact that he is there. That he's holding us in the palm of his hand. He's promised that. He's promised, I will supply all your needs according to my riches. He said, all things work together for good to those who love him and are called, adhering to, abiding by, depending on, trusting in his purpose. Sometimes living in this world makes us sad. And we see things happening that sort of take the wind out of our sails. But thank God, our life, the ongoing of our existence and those around us does not depend on anything but God being on his throne and God taking care of business. Now, he's told us that nobody gets into power that he doesn't allow it to happen. So I want to talk about a few specific things that we can think about when we pray. You know, I remember some of the statements of Jesus when he said he's going to put people at odds with one another, even within a family. Because some people will adhere to his word and some people will not. Some people will try to control other people with their own agenda, with complete disregard for any agenda that God might have. And while none of that is good, the good side is God is still there. God is still in the business of revealing himself to people so that they might respond to the grace that he has given us and the blood that was shed on the cross by Jesus Christ. And he has said, I'm come to give you a life and give, give, give you life in a more abundant fashion. Uh, maybe we would say it today, the best way of life is possible only through Jesus Christ. Now we know that and we say things like that to ourselves and even to other people. Um, I was recently witnessing pretty boldly to a person that I've known for a while and there just was no reception. And while my heart broke, I walked away knowing that God's not done yet with that situation. And he's the only one that knows how to bring somebody in to water the seed and to grant the increase. So as we look around us in this world about what's going on, a lot of opinions being expressed, the impeachment of the president again, And it can make us very sad. It can even make us mad, very angry, um, very, we could feel very defeated. We could feel like we have lost the battle, but we just need to be reminded, but the battle's not ours. Just like when Hezekiah put the choir in front of the army and marched out against another army. When they got to the place where the army was, the army had already been annihilated. Why? Because God took care of business. 
That was what God needed to do and God took care of it. Hezekiah was obedient. Hezekiah did what he was supposed to do. And the first thing he did was he had a call to prayer. So what I would like to do this morning is call you to prayer. We will pray together. And we know that we have the power of God at our fingertips. Prayer is our greatest tool. Prayer is mighty. Prayer is effective. We have all seen answers to our prayers. And prayer is a great source of comfort because we can remind ourselves even while we're praying when we might not be in such a great place, but we can begin to pray and God will begin to move on our heart and calm us in our spirit. And we can, in the final analysis, say, like Jesus said before he went to the cross, I'm going to paraphrase. He said, do I really have to do this? And then he said, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. Remember when Jesus was at the sea and the guys had been out fishing And they'd been fishing all night and hadn't caught anything. And Jesus said, let down your nets. Interesting enough, he said nets and Peter said net. I'll let down the net. And of course, we know that the net began to break. And we can harangue Peter for his lack of faith. But you know what he said? He said, nevertheless. I've got something on my mind. I've got something in my heart, and this is what I think I ought to do, and we've already tried that. And But nevertheless, at your word, Lord, I will let down the net. He didn't say Lord. But he understood that he was speaking to someone that knew what he was talking about. So when you pray, remember that you, you're talking to someone who knows what they're talking about, and they know how to get things done, they being Jesus God will take care of you. We sing that song. God will take care of you through every day or all the way. God will take care of you. God will take care of you. Sometimes, though, we just need to act like it, huh? We really vacillate. In our humanity, sometimes we're prone to give up. Sometimes we're prone to not demonstrate the kind of trust that Jesus has asked us to demonstrate in him. And I'm not trying this morning to be some sort of giant revelation giver because I'm not telling you anything you haven't heard before. But I think it's time for us as Christians to stand up and be reminded that God is on the throne and we need to act like it. We don't need to be pessimistic. We don't have to agree, but we need to pray. We need to pray for our families. A lot of my families and, and friends have been sick right now and, and man, have we been praying. And I've asked you to help pray for them. They're on the mend. They're getting better. Uh, our son texted me this morning, said this is my end, this is the end of my quarantine. 
and we rejoice that he's feeling better, he's getting better. And we as a church even have the situation right now where I'm preaching you to you from my my throne, if you will, the place where I sit often here in in our house. But we need to pray for our families. And you need to call their names in prayer every single day. There's so much out there to trip them up. There's so much out there. And we need to be reminded that, you know, Hezekiah's son was awful when he got on the throne. But I firmly believe because Hezekiah had prayed for him for so many years that when it came time, God still remembered those prayers and he sent someone to get that king's attention so that he would be turned around. And he did. He did turn himself around. He began to lead the kingdom of Judah in a proper manner. We need to pray for our church family. I'd appreciate it if you'd call my name in prayer every day. And I know you do pray for me. I see God's hand all the time on me and around me because of your prayers. I'll have to say this, Locust Grove, you're the praying bunch of folks I think I've ever seen, and I love it. I love it. I love it. But we need to not forget that our church family is our family. Not our, well, it is our blood family, but a different blood. You need to pray through that. I hope you have a personal prayer list and and you pray through that daily and then we have a corporate prayer list that we list those people in our bulletin every week. And we pray for them. And of course, we need to pray for the lost. There may be some people in your life that you're not even aware that don't know Jesus. And you need to ask the Lord to give you opportunities. And maybe you should make some inquiries. Find out and begin to pray for them. I remember my dad in his 80s and 90s praying specifically for people by name that he knew were lost. made a huge impact on me. And I think we need to pray for our protection. And I don't necessarily mean armed protection. I mean the protection of God. You know, there's, there's something that represented theologically about when, when we're walking with the Lord we are walking under the umbrella of umbrella of his protection. I'm not going to go into great detail about that, but you need to think about it that way. And I'm sure you've been through those circumstances where God has gotten your attention later and you realize that he brought you through a circumstance and you weren't even cognizant of his presence, but he was there. Obviously, we need to pray for the sick. We have a lot of sickness going on, especially with the COVID-19. And uh, I will keep you updated on my condition. At this point, I have no symptoms. Uh, I am thankful for that. and uh, But I'm being cautious. That's why you're seeing me preach from home today. Um I miss being with you today. I really do. But I think it's important that we understand that safety is a real key. And we have to be smart. A lot of our congregation are in the high-risk arena. 
And I know some have been vaccinated, but some of us haven't yet had that opportunity. So we need to um, be mindful to pray for each other. And we need to pray for those that are sick, and we need to pray preventively, I believe, about this COVID virus that we would all, that we would be protected. Uh, I know even though some have tested positive, they've really not shown any symptoms. So that's, that's a good thing. Uh, and, and here comes a, a, a bit of a sticky one, but I, I think we need to remember uh, to pray for our country. And if we pray for our country, that means we got to pray for our leaders. I, I know they're not going to always do what God wants. They're not going to act godly. They're not going to speak godly in a godly way sometimes. But nevertheless, we need to pray for them. I don't know. Um, whatever your personal opinion is about someone uh, in the political arena, be it our president, uh, elect, our vice president elect, uh, some of the Congress leaders. Um, but regardless of our opinion, we need to pray for them. God is in the business of intervention. And it's God who holds the reins. Don't ever forget that. We must never forget that God's power is never diminished, regardless of who's in the White House, regardless of who's in Congress. And if they take our country in a way that we don't want to go, we will still stand true for the gospel. Period. Whatever the consequence may be. Please pray for our military people. Uh, you're, my friend Bill is a Vietnam vet. Uh, and, uh, you know, God took him through that, spared him through that. And I've met numerous other Vietnam vets, and I'm, I'm very grateful for what they did. And any person that's ever been a military uh, my father included, uh, who was wounded in the World War II on the island of Saipan, we just need to pray for them. We need to pray for the souls of those young men. Many still get killed uh, on deployment, and we need to be praying that somehow we've got chaplains in the military that can be that are God's liaisons, that can be used by God to reach into the lives of those people. You've seen the picture of my dad uh, standing in the Pacific Ocean with his hand raised over two Marines as he's baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost because those chaplains matter. Everyone's life matters. Uh, so pray for our military folks, the military leaders, those that are actually on the firing line, and we talk a lot about our first responders, our police, our firefighters. That includes the sheriff's department. And we may not even like who's in office, but we still need to pray for them. We need to pray for God to protect them. We need to pray for our own opportunities to that God will pro provide a chance to be able to that they get ministered to with the gospel. Some of them have to work on Sunday, and so they may not get to go to church. But church isn't the only place you can be saved. In fact, most people are not are saved outside the church. The church is important in the process, and the church is important. And if the church is doing its job, it's it's presenting the gospel on a regular basis so that people can be saved at the church. But uh, many, many, many people come to the church after the fact. So that's why our personal lives are so important. And we pray for ourselves that we will have strength, that we will have courage, that we will have the ability to minister to people and to 
uh, take care of those who don't know Jesus yet. Our hospitals, we talk about first responders, but we always don't think in terms of the hospital, but we have so many workers at the hospital that are at such high risk. And, and I'm so grateful that, that several of the hospital employees uh, are parts of our congregation. And I, I, I pray for them all the time that God will continue to protect them and give them opportunity to, to share and to be faithful to Jesus. But the emergency room folks uh, who are most at risk and then uh, the doctors, nurses, uh, and, and all of those. Uh, I know it's no secret to you. When I say Jesus is on the throne, you already know that. When I tell you Jesus is in control, you already know that. When I tell you that Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father making intercession for you, and that Jesus, God has declared that you're a righteous person because you've trusted Jesus as your personal Savior. Now, if you're out there this morning and you are watching this on YouTube or Facebook, and you don't have the assurance in your heart that if your life were to be taken from you right now, for whatever reason, you would immediately go and be with Jesus and the Father in heaven. If you don't have that assurance in your heart, you just simply pray and say, God, I'm a sinner. I trust you with my life. I want you to take control of, of me and my life and help me be the person that you want me to be. And you too then can be declared righteous. Not because you're necessarily a good person, though I'm sure you probably are or consider yourself to be a good person. But being good is not quite enough. That's why God sent Jesus, so that we could come to know Jesus personally. and We could have a Savior and be saved from our selfish will and ways. Now, I want to tell you a story, another little story about prayer. And it's really just an illustration that I was watching TV one day and I flipped on this, this uh, TV pastor and I'm not, I don't watch him a lot, but I do some. And uh, uh, I, this man, the pastor named Robert Morris, and uh, he has a lot of great things to say. And he was I'll give you kind of a comical illustration, but it's something, some of it, it might mean something to some of you that you can, he, he had a ministry or has a ministry where a lot of ladies that are unable to um, bear children have come to him and asked for his prayers and so on and so forth. And some people that have been a not able to conceive for a long time, uh, and he prays for them. And I realize this may not work for everybody, but you need to understand. And I'm, I'm going to go on to another spot in praying in just a moment. But this is kind of a comical story where he started praying for this one particular lady and she started to have children uh, after a number of years of marriage and being unable to conceive, but then did and then uh, conceived again and conceived again. And after a few times, she she called in, uh, or maybe I believe it was a relative, so he called, this person called his mom or his wife and said, would you just please tell Brother Robert to stop praying? He can stop praying now because he uh, had been able to conceive several times. So while that's a little bit on the comical side, I know for many people that that's a real serious issue. And my heart goes out to you. And I understand that that, that can lead to a lot of personal anxiety. But he was praying for another one of his relatives, and um, I believe it was a daughter or daughter-in-law who was having the same difficulty or 
after she would conceive, not able to have uh, the baby last full term. And this happened more than once. And somebody asked him the question, and this is my main point. But why, what do you do when you pray for something and it doesn't happen? And this is what he said. You keep on trusting God. Because God, when it comes down to the final analysis of everything that I've talked about today and some things I even haven't even mentioned, but any issue you want to name or anxiety level or, or the bottom line is God is still the answer. I remember not long ago a friend who had gone through a real difficulty, difficult time said, you know, there's a song called Jesus is all I need. And this person told me, she said, you don't know how true that statement is that Jesus is all I need until everything else is gone and Jesus is all you have. I think that's really important. So, I want to leave you with this thought. Trust God. Trust God. Trust God. Because he has you in the palm of his hand. God bless you as you go through the rest of this day and keep praying, keep trusting.